I spend a surprising amount of my time telling my kids that they shouldn't do everything that comes into their head. <laughs> they lack that life experience that would trigger caution. They have a ton of energy and no inhibition. It's like living with little drunk people. I run a tech company, and it's not that different. There are drunk people running around everywhere, but not most of the time. But in technology, we have no parents. There's nobody to guide us towards things that move us forward, and away from things that are, you know, dangerous. We're kind of left to figure that out for ourselves. As a species, we're editing DNA. And in the coming decades, it's likely that we're going to eradicate a whole pile of genetic diseases. We create new variants of crops that require shorter growing seasons and tolerate drought. And we're editing the DNA of mosquitoes so that they can't breed or transmit disease. But what happens when we start using those same DNA editing techniques we use in agriculture on our kids? Because we will. My wife and I both come from genetic lines that carry at least one of the mutations responsible for breast and ovarian cancer, and that means our kids are probably carriers too, and that sucks. If the technology had existed for us to repair that mutation before we passed it along to our kids, we probably would have used it. Even with the knowledge that any time we monkey with nature, there's that chance of unexpected consequence. It's not like we know what we're doing. In evolutionary terms, we're the same dumb animal that was walking the earth 50,000 years ago. We're no smarter today than we were then. The only thing that differentiates us from that primitive beast is technology. Language is a technology. The ability to write things down and transfer knowledge from generation to generation is a technology. We're a primitive beast that's discovering things at an astonishing rate, and we just need to be aware of that, and we need to be careful. The rate at which we're bringing new technology into existence is increasing. It used to be that you know we had time to adapt, but that's no longer the case. My wife and I just bought a car that sees the lines on the road and helps us steer. And you know what we did? We turned it off. <laughs> For the life of us, we could not figure out how to drive like that. This morning, my phone updated itself again, <laughs> and now I'm having trouble working it again. I run a technology company, and I can't work my phone half the time. But to find an example of a technology that's gone completely sideways on us, we need look no further than nuclear. And I'm not saying nuclear technology is bad. No technology is inherently good or bad. Technology just is. But we can't talk about nuclear technology without acknowledging its dark side and our spectacular failure in controlling it. Forget about the Cuban Missile Crisis. You know what scares me? The close calls that we know about, 1979, 1983, and 1995, we brought ourselves to within minutes of extinction. We've accidentally dropped two large nuclear weapons on North Carolina, one of which armed itself and nearly went off. Like little kids who don't know how to clean up after themselves, we still don't have a good solution for what to do with all of our spent nuclear fuel. And now we have a, an impulsive president toddling us all towards nuclear war.、And、that can leave you feeling kind of hopeless and powerless. But the rise of technology is also changing the game. Never before 
in the arc of human history have individuals held so much power to affect global change. Our company sent a team to Amman, Jordan, to see if artificial intelligence could be used to help formulate a response to the refugee crisis. The world's facing the largest number of displaced people since the end of World War II, now estimated at over 65 million people. We met with extraordinary people working the front lines of that crisis, doing everything they can with what they have to keep people alive and to get them somewhere safe. We met with people from the United Nations and UNICEF, the International Committee for the Red Cross. A recurring theme was the need to reunite families, including where it involved identifying the dead. Over 28,000 people are forced to flee their homes every day because of conflict. And families can end up separated in, across refugee camps or spontaneous settlements. They might make a run for it over land to Lebanon or Jordan or Turkey, or in what could only charitably be called a boat to southern Europe. And many don't make it. We saw an opportunity to use facial recognition to help reunite these families. So we brainstormed some ideas, we flew home, and we got to work. We built a small portable camera, similar to a police body cam, only this one can recognize faces it's been taught to look for. So now we have this tool we can use to locate missing people as they arrive on those beaches in southern Europe or out in the field in spontaneous settlements and refugee camps in conflict zones. And today we're working on getting it into the hands of aid workers so that they can put it to use. But then we thought, what else could we do with this thing? So we taught it to recognize the UPS truck. We got it to send us an alert when an unrecognized person came to the house. We taught it to recognize the neighbor's dog and turn on the sprinklers when she came over to poop in our yard. <laughs> but in our current political environment, it's not hard to imagine this being used in nefarious ways. Computer vision is a near-perfect tool for racial profiling. What happens when the license plate scanners we drive through at toll booths every day start to perform facial or ethnic recognition? Because they will. We captured all your faces tonight. We could look through them to see who out there might be Hispanic and maybe undocumented, or Somali, or Arab. But then we're making it so easy for them. We are all posting an enormous amount of personal data to the internet. And that means with a little digging, we can figure out who you are, where you live, who is your significant other, who are your friends, where you like to hang out, and what your political leanings are. And that's an incredibly powerful tool for anyone interested in political repression. And that at a time when we're seeing a resurgence of authoritarianism across the globe and here at home. We can take it a step further and weaponize it, targeting individual eyes. Now somebody's 100 bucks in parts from building a blinding laser weapon that's illegal under international law, but that they could build in their garage. So. Where are the grown-ups? Who are our grown-ups? It's pretty easy to make the argument that our lawmakers are not equipped to answer these questions for us. And if history is any guide, they're going to push us in the wrong direction. We're going to need to force their hand. Fortunately, there are organizations like the Union of Concerned Scientists, formed in 1969 by a bunch of researchers at MIT, during the height of the Vietnam War. They now have over 100,000 members, and they work every day to direct scientific research away from the military and towards solving humanity's pressing environmental and social problems. 
and there's the International Committee for the Red Cross, the defenders of the Geneva Convention. They document the use of illegal weapons of war and the indiscriminate or intentional targeting of civilians. Now, they need and deserve our help. And we do that by getting back to electing lawmakers that support the ideals of international humanitarian law. We used to do that. We used to pride ourselves on that. And those of us working in technology, we have a responsibility to lead through the choices that we make. We don't have to take jobs building more advanced weapons or tools that could be used to support a, a surveillance state. We can make a conscious decision to direct our efforts towards projects that benefit the common good, because there are a ton of things that we can and should do. And it's the choices that we make that could very well determine the future of our species and our planet. Thank you.